So hello, my name is Chris Simmons and I'm here to talk to you about Yocto Project and Android. How are they the same and how are they different? Uh, here's a license for this stuff and here is some background information on me. But the main thing I want to talk about is Yocto Project and Android. So previously I have spoken about Yocto Project and Debian. Uh, at Embedded Linux Conference and various other places as well. I've also spoken about Android and whether Android makes a suitable embedded operating system. So now I want to combine these two threads together and talk about Yocto Project and Android. How are they similar? How are they different? So on the compare side, Yocto Project and AOSP, uh, the Android Open Source Project, are in some ways the same. They are both open source, they are both build systems, and they can both build uh, full operating systems that suit the kind of needs that we have for embedded devices. So they are both used by many people um, all over the world for a whole range of embedded products. And yet they are also quite different. Uh, so Yocto Project is a classic, community-driven uh, open source project designed to, for maximum flexibility and to produce uh, a whole wide range of operating systems for embedded devices. AOSP, on the other hand, is very much sponsored by uh, Google and they control the direction that it goes, mostly to target the devices they care about, smartphones. So the differences really come down to ownership, control of the project, and the community around that project. And I will look at all that in a little while. But first of all, let's have a look at some technical stuff. I'll begin then with an overview of Yocto Project. Uh, so Yocto Project is, uh, as they like to say on their website, uh, it's not an embedded Linux distribution, but it can build one for you. So it is based on the Bitbake build tool and open embedded and uh, Yocto project specific uh, metadata. And together these can produce uh, operating systems of a wide range of different capabilities. So let's start off by getting a copy of Yocto project. Uh, so you can do that by using the git clone command I give at the top of the slide there. And what do you get? Well, you'll get roughly 55 megabytes of tools and documentation and metadata. And also quite a lot of git history. So it is quite small. One of the reasons it's quite small is that you only have the tools and the metadata to build things. You don't have the actual source code. That, is, that comes along later. So having cloned your copy of Pocky, uh, you then CD into the Pocky directory, you source a script, and that sets up the build environment for you. And it also will create for you, if you're doing this the first time, uh, a build directory. And by default, that directory is actually called build. then in that directory it will create a configuration uh, subdirectory and it will put in there a file called local.conf. So here you set a whole bunch of uh, project specific configuration including the name of the machine you want to build for. So for example I'm building here for a BeagleBone so I put machine equals BeagleBone and that will pick up the BeagleBone board support packages. But it could just as well be Raspberry Pi or uh, generic PC or whatever. So the metadata I keep referring to uh, is a bunch of things, but especially it is recipes. So recipes are files that are consumed by the Bitbake build tool, and a recipe typically will download source code from upstream and compile it and produce a binary package and then it will take those binary packages at the end of the, of the process and build for me uh, images uh, for the root file system and other components. 
So just so you have an idea what I'm talking about, this is a bitbake recipe. So this is a BB file and it's going to build a simple Hello World program. This particular recipe is not typical in one way in that if you see down here where it says source URI, this is referencing a local file. Most recipes don't build local files. They will reference here um, a remote server uh, using HTTPS or something like that, or they can reference a Git repository, in which case the recipe will download the code from that server or Git repository and then build it for you. So now I want to tie together uh, the configuration, uh, the recipes, and this idea of layers. So a layer is a collection of recipes. And we have two in my example here called Meta and MetaPocky. The layers you're using in your project are uh, defined in another configuration file, which is in your uh, conf directory. This one is bblayers.conf. So if I want to add more layers to my project, I just extend bblayers.conf. And then I also have the local.conf there specifying the machine I'm building for, for example, BeagleBone, and the distro, uh, which by default will be called Pocky. So amongst those recipes will be image recipes. So an image recipe is a kind of top level recipe which lists the packages that you want to build into your target. And here are three examples of such image recipes. Uh, there's one called Core Image Minimal. This will generate the smallest possible um, uh, Linux, embedded Linux uh, system, which will be just enough to boot the system and give you a root uh, shell and not much else. But there are many others, uh, including examples on the slide there. And so the process goes something like this. I bit bake a recipe. Typically, I bit bake a image recipe. Uh, Bitbake will work out all the dependencies, and then it will iterate through downloading those dependencies from upstream source. So, uh, for example, th these will be tar.gz files. It downloads those, uh, configures and compiles them to produce packages. By default, these will be RPM binary packages, although there can be other formats. And then as the final stage, it will take those RPM files, those packages, and it will extract them to generate the final root file system. So this idea of layers or meta layers, everything is meta in a Yocto project, um, actually makes a Yocto project very extensible and very powerful thereby. So we can uh, starting from a simple configuration, we can add in the layers for whichever components we might need. So there is a semi-official list of layers at this link here. Let me just click on that for a moment. So this is the Open Embedded Layer Index, and it lists, um, I haven't counted, but quite a few hundred uh, layers. Uh, some of these layers are labeled as being machine or BSP layers. So these have the metadata required to build for a particular machine. If I scroll down a little bit, bear with me for a moment. Uh, beyond that, we have layers that are labeled with type distribution. So distribution is uh, the policy uh, as to which packages you should, you should choose uh, when Bitbake is building stuff. For example, there is a distribution here called Automotive Grade Linux or Meta AGL. And this is the layer you would use if you're doing stuff with automotive uh, head units and that kind of thing. And then scrolling down a little bit further, I'll skip that for a minute. <laughs> um, there are a bunch of layers called software. Uh, so these are a variety of things. They include things like uh, graphics libraries, um, I can see there's one here for Amazon AWS if you want to integrate AWS into your product uh, and that kind of thing. 
So switching back to the slides. Yeah, so the layers, as you can see, there's a lot of layers there. Uh, so we looked at machine layers. Meta Raspberry Pi would be an example of that. Uh, distributions, software layers. And then there's another category called miscellaneous, which is basically stuff that doesn't fit into any of the other categories. In addition to these layers, uh, almost every SOC vendor and uh, board vendor will have their own layers. Uh, so you can incorporate and run uh, Yocto project based uh, operating systems on their hardware. So what can you do with Yocto project? Uh, and the answer is, uh, in principle, anything you want. Well, certainly a very large number of things anyhow. So here are some things that I personally worked on. Uh, so I worked on a ticketing machine, uh, issuing tickets for trams and trains and that kind of thing. Uh, I did some work on a pure water purity testing machine. It's got to be done. Uh, a little smart uh, entry phone uh, device. So that was a fairly simple device with a touchscreen interface, um, which is a replacement for the classic entry phone thing. Uh, I've done quite a lot of work over the years on automotive systems, uh, based, for example, on AGL, and also on uh, communications, including 4G and 5G base stations. So these are just some random uh, uh, examples that I've worked on. There are many, many, many other examples uh, that I'm sure you know of. Okay, so that's Yocto. How about AOSP? So here we are talking specifically about the Android open source project. This is the open source components of Android. So AOSP consists of a build system, a base operating system, which we call the native layer. So the native layer includes an init program, the daemons that init will launch, a command shell, all the libraries to support all that stuff, and the hardware abstraction layer. Then above that, we have the Android framework and the Android runtime. So these are the core parts of the Android operating system, uh, for the most part written in Java. And then at the top level, as part of AOSP, there are some fairly simple demo apps. So there is a home screen called Launcher 3. Uh, there's also, I think, a Launcher 2 in there somewhere. Uh, there is a settings app, so you can go and tweak the settings of the operating system. And there are some simple apps like Desk Clock and Calculator and that kind of stuff. Just demos, nothing particularly useful. Now, all Android devices actually are based on this very same code base. Everything is AOSP, and then there are layers on top of that so that the, the Android phone in your pocket has uh, a lot of polished applications put on top of this. But underneath, it's all the same stuff. Uh, in terms of licensing, uh, the preferred license from Google is Apache. So most of their code is written using the Apache 2.0 license. But there are also some components using BSD licenses and maybe some others that I've not actually tracked down yet. So AOSP is open source which is nice. It means we can do whatever we like with it. We can take AOSP, modify it, tweak it, and ship it. And this is exactly what people do. So Amazon, for example, use AOSP for their Fire-branded devices, including the Kindle Fire and such things. And we can use it to build embedded operating systems, so-called embedded Android. Um, the kind of things you would use it for, uh, so test and measurement is quite a big thing. Essentially anything that has a touch screen is a good candidate for embedded Android. Uh, so test and measurement, so oscilloscopes, um, uh, frequency analyzers, that kind of thing. Uh, digital, av digital advertising is a big area, uh, typically based on uh, the Android TV and set-top boxes based on Android TV. And one particular case I've noticed is marine navigation. So um, when you have your yacht parked in the harbor, uh, um, yeah, I, okay, I don't have a yacht, but I could have, you never know. 
um, then that yacht would have a navigation system and there's a good chance that navigation system actually will be running Android for its user interface. Now in all of these cases you probably wouldn't be aware that Android is being used because these are deeply embedded. Uh, these are mostly single-use, single-application Android devices. Um, so let's have a look at what AOSP is composed of. So AOSP is built from a fairly large number of components. Each one of these components is a Git repository stored um, in the default case at least at googlesource.com. The list of um, uh, projects, <laughs> let's try that again. The list of uh, Git repositories that you're going to use in any particular uh, implementation are held in this thing, uh, this manifest file. So this is an XML file with a particular format. And you can see down here where we have um, project. So each one of these uh, refers essentially to a Git repository. So the repository in this case would be platform slash art at googlesource.com. And when we uh, get this project, it will be stored locally in a directory called art. So this is just the first few lines uh, of a manifest. A typical manifest is eight or 900 lines long. And then there's a tool called repo that can process these manifests. So you use repo in two phases. First of all, you run repo init and you give it a pointer to the manifest you want uh, to grab. Again, this is the canonical um, manifest from Google. And I can optionally give a tag to clone a particular uh, version of this manifest. Um, so repo init is a fairly fast operation. That's just going to copy the manifest and the components that support that. And then I run repo sync. So repo sync is going to iterate through that manifest file and do a git clone of each one of these several hundred repositories. Now here's a difference between AOSP and Yocto project. Whereas Yocto uh, will download the code as needed on demand as it builds things, uh, with AOSP when we run, run a repo sync that is going to download absolutely everything all in one go. So a repo sync is going to take quite a while and it's going to download in excess of 100 gigabytes of stuff. And here's another difference. Um, I didn't actually mention this in the uh, Yocto uh, overview, but when you run Yocto, one of the things it will build uh, will be a tool chain for whichever supported platform you have selected, for example, the BeagleBone. Um, AOSB doesn't build the tool chains uh, on the fly. Instead, the tool chains are supplied pre-built as binaries in a directory called pre-builts. And you will find in there various versions of the Clang compiler and since Android 11, uh, also a Rust compiler. And these tool chains and the things around them will support uh, the AOSB architectures, which are ARM, and x86 in both 32 and 64 bit variants. Uh, so the fact that the tool chains are supplied uh, pre built it does have some implications. So whilst it reduces time uh, during the build phase, it, uh, you end up downloading more stuff during the repo sync phase. So each tool chain is quite a few megabytes. Um, and we end up, if you look in the uh, pre-built Clang directory and dig down a little bit, you'll see there are eight or ten different versions of Clang in there for backwards compatibility, I guess. So this inflates the size of the pre-built directory and currently, so I'm talking about Android 11 here, it's about 42 gigabytes. Okay, the build system. So the build system for AOSP is called Soong. And Soong parses recipes uh, written in a language called Blueprint. These are both basically unique to AOSP. 
Um, here's an example of a uh, blue, uh, sorry, of a blueprint recipe. Uh, so the recipes always are in files called android.bp, and you can see here that this is uh, what we call a module. So this is the type of module. CC indicates it's a C and C++ code, so we use a CC compiler. Um, the binary part means this is going to produce a binary executable. And then within the curly brackets, we have the attributes of this module. So this is a very simple module. Uh, it has a name. All modules have to have a name. Then a list of source files, just one in this case, a list of libraries, and optionally some C flags. So when Soong processes this Android BP file, it is going to compile lmkd.c, link it with a couple of libraries, and it will end up with an executable which will have the same name as the module. We'll end up with an executable called lmkd, and that will be installed in the system slash bin directory. In addition to the components written by Google, if you go look in a directory called external, which is part of AOSP, you will see there are several hundred uh, upstream open source projects. And in the listing on the right there, I, list, uh, I just have a random collection of them. So these are local copies of upstream source, for, uh, source projects. Why do we need to do this? Well, Basically, it's because the Soong build tool doesn't know anything about open source packaging. So it doesn't support auto tools or CMake or even Makefile. It can't, pro it can't even process just a regular Makefile. So what has happened here is that the Android developers or somebody has included these uh, upstream projects uh, within the externals directory and somebody's had to sit down and handcraft an Android BP file for it. And that can be simple or it can be difficult depending on the project. AOSP comes with a bunch of board support packages uh, for devices. And these are mostly in the directory devices, but they can also be in a directory called vendor. So for each device, there is a subdirectory. And within that subdirectory, there will be a file called androidproducts.mk. Uh, so this essentially defines the device. Um, it, adds, uh, it can also add the device to the lunch menu, which I mentioned on the next slide. And it gives a pointer to the device make file. So altogether, this is going to define the software configuration uh, of the device. The, in other words, the list of packages and the type of packages used on this device. The other important file is called boardconfig.mk. So this, as the name suggests, is the hardware configuration. So in here we specify uh, the CPU architecture and sub-architecture. We um, uh, give a list of the flash memory partitions and their sizes and similar stuff. So you get a, a default set of board support packages uh, with the AOSP download. And typically when you're working with a particular board from a particular manufacturer, um, they will supply their own uh, device configurations for those boards. So Android Products MK, like I say, that points to what we call the device make file. And this contains the software configuration for the for the uh, the device. One of the things you do here is you uh, you inherit uh, a base configuration for whatever type of device it is you're building. So in this example, I am inheriting AOSB base telephony .mk. So this would build for me essentially a smartphone. Um, as well as smartphones, I can select configurations to build a tablet or a TV or an Android Automotive OS uh, system. So, as we said, the Android products.mk file um, adds uh, 
um, a, a product to the lunch menu. So in order to build something, you first of all have to set up the environment. So in my example, we source build slash env setup.sh. You always have to do this. And then you can run lunch. And lunch will give me a list of things configured in my devices directory. So say I want to build um, a for a dragon board 845. So I select DB845C, which I see is number 38 on my menu. So I type 38 and hit enter. So now I'm configured to build for that particular device. And then I can do a build. I type uh, M or make if you like. And then I go for a walk, quite a long walk actually, because it's going to take a few hours uh, to build. Um, AOSP, however, doesn't do the whole thing for you. It really only produces the root file system. In addition to that, then, you're going to need a kernel and, of course, a bootloader. Well, let's just talk about the kernel for the moment. Um, so, historically, uh, it's been up to the OEM or the SOC vendor to, to supply a kernel for, the hard, for whatever hardware you have. The Android developers produce a reference kernel called the Android Common Kernel, which you can download from googlesource.com. Uh, and then the SOC vendors take that and they modify it with usually thousands of in-house patches to make it work on their particular hardware. This whole process takes a little while, which is one reason why the Linux kernel versions used on Android devices tends to be quite old, uh, two or three or more years um, behind um, uh, upstream kernels. This bit, however, is changing. Um, since Android 11, we have a thing called the Generic Kernel Image, or GKI. So this is quite a big change to the, to the uh, infrastructure for Android. The basic idea is that instead of everybody producing their own kernel, there will be just a single kernel, or at least a single kernel code base, uh, which is produced by the Android developers. And then everybody, whether your phone is from uh, Samsung or Nokia or someone else entirely, they will all be running exactly the same kernel. Now, of course, there still needs to be some uh, device-specific um, kernel modules in there. So each vendor will provide a set of uh, Linux kernel modules which add in the necessary features for their particular chipsets. And I have a feeling that most of these are going to be binary-only modules. So I think the net result of this is that there's going to be much more binary-only uh, binary blobs in your uh, Android device. Which brings me on then to the question, can you make a 100% open source Android product? And the truthful answer here really is no. Why is this? Well, because of these things I've just mentioned. In addition to which, we have the uh, support for OpenGL for a given graphics uh, GPU chipset. These are almost always proprietary. We have the hardware abstraction layer, the HALs. These are usually proprietary and binary only. Even before GKI, we had binary kernel modules, typically for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and the data modem. Um, GKI, I think, is going to accelerate that, so we have many more binary kernel modules. And finally, there are a bunch of binaries that you need to load into various parts of the system as you boot up. So these binary blobs are, to be honest, a real pain. Uh, they tie us into a particular vendor and to a particular version of the software. And they also tie us into the support timescale of that particular SOC vendor. Because once they stop supporting a binary uh, component, there's nothing we can do about it. So binary blobs are a pain. Ideally, they would go away, but they seem to be doing the opposite. We seem to be getting more of them. Okay, the next few slides 
So from time to time, people observe to me that Android is the most popular Linux distro ever. And in a very trivial way, that is true, since Android is based on a Linux kernel, uh, Android is the most popular version of Linux. Um, but it is not a distro in any real sense. For, AOS, for Android to be a distro, I would need to be able to take uh, a project, an open source project, that for example runs on Debian, and have it run on Android. Now, naturally, I can't. I wouldn't expect to do that as a uh, binary. I don't. I don't expect binary compatibility necessarily. But I would like source code compatibility. But that doesn't exist either. Um, so the next couple of slides, I highlight four particular areas, which illustrate why Android is not a Linux distro. First of all, incompatible and incomplete shared libraries. So the most obvious thing here is if we look at the C library. The C library in Android is uh, called Bionic, which is a very stripped down uh, C library, and which is not POSIX compatible. It emits quite a few POSIX functions. So if you're compiling your code against Bionic, you'll find that a bunch of things don't link, and you're going to have to change your code to fix that. But not only is it the C library, there are a whole load of other system libraries you would expect to find or be able to install uh, onto the system that are simply missing in Android. And as we mentioned already, it's difficult to add libraries to, um, to Android because the build system doesn't understand open source packaging. But it's not only that. Uh, the library loader, LD dash android.so uh, has its own peculiarities. In particular, there is a thing called the VNDK, which is the Vendor Native Development Kit, introduced as part of Project Treble in Android 8. Uh, essentially, the VNDK is a fairly complex set of rules for linker namespaces. And it essentially limits where you can load libraries from. So you can't simply plonk a library in uh, the VNDK quite likely will not allow that unless you go and change its rules, which you may also find difficult. Another big drag is SE Linux and the security policy in general. Now, SE Linux is a good thing, don't get me wrong. I like SE Linux. It makes the system more secure. But the snag is that the policy written that you uh, for Android and supplied with AOSP is very much geared towards the use cases that interest Google. And you can't defeat it. So you can't disable it. It's enforced by the init program. If you disable it, the init program will, the init program will simply refuse to run. Maybe you could write your own init program, but then you're into big changes. And also, the rules are enforced at build time by Soong. There are various uh, checks in there which will give you build errors if you try and do things that don't fit the policy. So this makes things unnecessarily complicated and make it difficult to add stuff at the lower level of the operating system. And then fourthly, I've mentioned this already, in fact, uh, the build system soon does not understand upstream stuff. And so if you want to integrate something, you're going to have to sit down and write an Android BP file and resolve the other things I mentioned on this slide and the previous one. So adding stuff to Android is not easy. Also, you should realize that AOSP is not a stable platform, by which I mean that the internal ABIs and the SE policy and the link and namespaces and the locations of uh, files and various things change from one Android version to the next. So if you have added extensions to AOSP, which depend on any of these things, APIs or policy or whatever, then they are going to break when you try and upgrade to the next version of Android. And there are usually two responses to that. The most common response, unfortunately, is to just not do the upgrade. 
and so you end up repeatedly with embedded Android devices based on ancient versions and uh, vulnerable versions of AOSP, um, but the cost of upgrading to a later supported version is just too high. Uh, the other response is to bite the bullet and actually go and make the changes. Yeah, but not so many people do that. So the only ABIs that are stable in Android are the ABIs associated with Android applications. Obviously, uh, the Android developers don't want to break Android applications because they need to keep on working from one version to the next. And also, the vendor HAL is a protected uh, ABI. Um, because it is important to be able to uh, switch board support packages without having to uh, upgrade the main operating system or actually more likely the other way around uh, to upgrade um, the main Android application, uh, the main Android operating system, the system image, uh, without upgrading the vendor HALs. But beyond those, everything, all bets are off. So, how far can you go with embedded Android? Um, so here I'm kind of rolling back a little bit on some of the things I may have mentioned here in the past. So essentially, um, the main message is don't mess with the base operating system. Any changes you make, which depend on these ABIs I've just been talking about, will most likely break in the next release. Now, this isn't to say you can't make any changes to AUSP. It's fine to add uh, additional native services or daemons. Uh, the APIs for that are fairly robust and stable. There will be some breakage, but probably not that major. If you want to go a little bit further, it is also possible to add system services. And the APIs to do that, again, are reasonably stable, although not so stable as for the native daemons. If you're going to do these things, however, make sure that you are not doing anything too intrusive. Otherwise, you are building for yourself a support burden and you're going to make it difficult to upgrade later on. So the best thing to do actually is not modify the base operating system, but actually keep as much as possible in applications. The APK layer is stable. And if you want to do lower level stuff, you can put stuff into, uh, you can use NDK to bundle uh, uh, libraries. And some libraries are supported upstream. For example, if you want to use GStreamer, then uh, the GStreamer project has support for Android uh, to include these into uh, applications via NDK. And um, uh, OpenCL and OpenCD and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so uh, let's move on then uh, to have a quick look at the develop development processes of both of these projects. So the development process uh, for Yocto project is a uh, classic open source project. So there are uh, mail lists where we can communicate uh, and uh, see the decisions made by uh, the developers. Uh, the Git repositories are open, and we can see every Git commit and the messages associated with those Git commits. And though we can also delve deep, more deeply, for example, there is a weekly, weekly project status report which you can uh, look at and, and uh, receive on the mail list, so you can see exactly where Yocto is um, week by week, day by day, even hour by hour. AOSP is the complete opposite. Um, most of the development on AOSP is closed, so we can't see what's happening from day to day or even month to month. Uh, the roadmap for the operating system is not published. There are various hints uh, that leak out from time to time, but with no real idea, for example, today um, in early September, I have no idea what is going to be in Android 12, even though it's probably going to be released uh, before you see this video. If we go to the Git repositories at googlesource.com, you will see there is a master branch there. Or well, maybe it's called main these days. Um, 
And you may think that is the next release. It really is not. Let me show you what actually happens. So this represents uh, two timelines. The top one uh, represents the timeline for the master branch. So this is one that's publicly available. But like I say, this is not where the development actually happens. At the beginning of a development cycle, the Android developers take a copy. So they create a private copy of master, and then they do most of their development on this private copy here. And they will work on that for eight or 10 months or whatever. When they're ready, usually in September, or October, uh, they will do a release. So essentially they'll make this branch public. And then over the next couple of months, they will merge the, the new release into the master branch. So by the end of this period here, uh, the master branch contains all the changes that were in the Android 10 uh, branch. And then once they've done that, they, re they repeat the process. They grab a copy of the master, work on that internally for eight or 10 months. That's your next release. So um, the development is, the license while that says is open, but the develop met development methodology is very definitely closed. Um, so let's talk a little bit about community. Community and Yocto project. Yocto project is all about the community. And the uh, developers on Yocto project are very supportive of the community. They are available on mail lists and via uh, chat channels of various sorts. You will find them at various conferences um, and they're always willing to help. Well, nearly always, let's be fair. Um, there's a steering committee, so you know the goals of the project uh, and you know where it's going and um, how far it's got. AOSP, well, you know what I'm going to say here. AOSP is the opposite. There isn't really much community at all. Um, Google don't really encourage um, community. They like to have complete control over the Android operating system. Uh, they do the development in secret, as we've just said. Uh, the Android developers don't uh, make themselves available via mail, li mail lists, so it's difficult to ask questions about how it's meant to work, what you're meant to do with things, um, and why certain errors are happening. So AOSP doesn't really have any community. Oh yes, and resourcing. Well, yeah, again, chalk and cheese. Uh, Yogto project, no, so Android, let's start with Android here. Um, um, well, both Android and Yocto are loss making, obviously. They are open source projects. They do not of themselves generate any revenue. That's obvious. Um, but in the case of Android, uh, the Android operating system produces a very large revenue for Google uh, via various indirect ways, advertising, search, um, information, all that kind of stuff. And so it makes sense for Google to sponsor AOSP and to maintain a fairly large development team. Yocto, on the other hand, uh, doesn't have uh, that kind of benefit. So it has some sponsorship from Linux Foundation, who uh, sponsor um, uh, some developers. And there are donations and sponsorship from other organizations, but it's on a much, much lower level. So the net effect is Android evolves quickly, uh, but in the direction that is specified by Google. Uh, Yocto project evolves rather more slowly, uh, but in a way that is compatible with a, large, a much larger range of people. So nearly done, let me bring you then to a conclusion. So my conclusion essentially is that with AOSP, with Android, what you get is what you get. So if that fits what you want to do, that's fine. Go ahead. Everything's, everything's good. But I have encountered people who have tried to mold AOSP into places where it's not really intended to go. And I've seen people 
essentially wasting time trying to modify AOSP when it probably would have been much easier to start from scratch uh, and build the product using Yocto. And then my final uh, uh, point is really a call out uh, for community-based projects and Yocto project is one such, but there are many, many, ors, many, many more as well. So this is a call out for these, uh, these projects and the people who work on them. They all deserve a little love and where appropriate, uh, I think it would be good for us developers uh, to push the awareness of these projects up the uh, tree within our organization and um, maybe uh, get a chance to commit a little bit more upstream, maybe uh, get to the point where we can actually do donations, or at least the, the people we work for can donate some money upstream. That would uh, level the field a little bit. So thank you very much. Um, that is the end of the presentation. If you have any questions, please go ahead and ask them on the appropriate channels and I will be there to uh, answer those questions on the day. Meanwhile, the slides, slides are available at that link there. So thank you all very much uh, for listening and watching and I hope to see you in person at the next Embedded Linux conference, wherever that may be.